I am going to be mainly talking about the new CFS selection toolkit for selecting archaeological archives. Um, this talk is very wordy, so I've topped and tailed it with pictures, but pretty much everything else is just words, I'm afraid. So, um, Okay, so um, the creation of a stable, ordered, and accessible archive should be the goal of any archaeological project. Um, the records, materials, and results of post excavation analysis should be available for examination and reinterpretation. They are a tangible legacy of our archaeological endeavours, and they'll be passed on to museums and other repositories for care in perpetuity. Archives are what we leave behind. After all the open days are finished, after the report is written, and the planning requirement is fulfilled, and the project is technically finished. So archaeological archives should be available and accessible to support research, teaching, outreach, engagement, and display activities. And we've already heard of a few of the ways that can happen today. However, the current legacy, as represented by archaeological archives, isn't actually that great. The lack of storage space in museums and the reduction of museum expertise has been widely reported over the last few years. Back in 2011, Southport Group reported that archaeology stores were full capacity. In 2012, FAME estimated that there were 9,000 archaeological archives in England and able to be deposited within the repository. And in 2013, Museum Archaeology Report estimated that museum expertise in archaeology had reduced by over a third. Since these reports came out, the problem has not lessened. If anything, the figures are probably worse. While many archives have been deposited, many, many, many more have been created. And um, this crisis is regularly discussed and debated throughout the sector, generally from the perspective that archives are problematic, time-consuming, expensive and difficult to manage. Anecdotal stories from museums describe abandoned archives, inaccessible and unused, with museums struggling to justify their continued storage of the creation of, curation of boxes that they can't immediately perceive as having future potential. One published opinion is that archaeological archives are not worth the space and time they take up within museum stores. So is this opinion justified? Well, the current three-year SMA Museums Collecting Archaeology Survey has unfortunately, but not surprisingly, demonstrated that many of the anecdotal stories around the storage crisis are based on real, on-the-ground reductions in resource and capacity. Back in 2016, the first report concluded that 23% of museums have stopped collecting archaeology archives, and of those that still collect, 63% will have run out of space in five years. Space and lack of expertise are cited as the main reasons for the museum ceasing to collect. Years two and three of the report, which came out two days ago, basically continue along the same vein, with not much change. So these reports have therefore clarified the need to ensure that archaeological archives contain only those elements that are useful for future research, display, engagement, outreach, and all the other types of activities you can use them for. This is not just about space in museums, it's about the legacy of our archaeological projects. What are we leaving for others to store, manage, and curate in perpetuity? How are we presenting them for curation? And how are we making this very important resource accessible and sustainable for current and future generations. So there has been an increase in focus on being more selective when it comes to what we choose to retain in all these archives we are creating. So selection of the working project archive is beginning to take place across the sector. However, the process is by no means universal and recording and documentation of such a process is generally touchy at best. So to help with this, there have been several calls for national guidance on the selecting of archaeological archive material. Um, the CIFA Archives Group Annual Day Conference in 2016 on selection, retention and rationalisation. Um, delegates called for national level guidance on selection, endorsement at a national level, and selection to be included right at the start of projects in project specifications. Um, one of the 21st century challenges um, in archaeology Proposed action was unified core guidance endorsed by all the relevant people on archive selection and deposition. And the 2017 Mendoza Review into Museums in England contained a commitment to improve the long term sustainability of the archaeological archives generated by developer funded excavations. Even back as far as 2011, the Southport report stipulated the need for selection strategies to be included at the start of archaeological projects. So, 
The new CIFA Selection Toolkit project is a direct, direct response to all these calls for national guidance. But before I discuss the toolkit, I think it's important to note that this project does not actually stand alone. Um, it's part of a large interrelated set of projects currently being undertaken across the sector, looking at the issues raised in the 21st Century Challenges Report and the Mendoza Review. So there's the SMA um, collecting report, which I've already discussed. There's the 2017 HE project gathering information on deep storage facilities in England. There's the HE funded survey into museum deposition charges, which was published this year. There's the very recently published report by Algeo looking at the relationship between um, planning policy and the creation and management of archaeological archives, which is a very good report with um, all the background of this, this whole issue. There's the current Deep Ventures project, Work Digital Think Archive, which later this year is going to produce um, guidance on how to create and manage your digital data. And then there was the SMA guidance on the rationalisation of museum archaeology collections. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about the rationalisation of uh, museum archaeology collections, but it is relevant because the SMA project assessed precisely the concept that rationalisation would solve this um, crisis through five scoping studies. And um, while it was found that the audits required by a rationalisation process were very useful because they provided you lots of information about your museum collection so you could access it better, the main conclusion was that the cost of rationalisation far exceeded um, the, um, and outweighed the benefits of the resource and space created. So, for example, one museum concluded that um, if they were to rationalise the 568 boxes they had identified as in need of rationalisation, um, it would cost them £259,000 and it would free up 10 cubic metres of museum storage space, which, as you see, can't, no, no one's going to fund that project, especially for that amount of money, you could probably build a whole new store. So this is all proof that in order to support sustainable archaeological collecting for the future, archives need to be um, selected and accompanied by comprehensive documentation, and this all needs to happen prior to it reaching the museum store in the first place. So we're back to the um, big question of how do we do this? So the, um, the creation of the section toolkit was a cross um, cross section project funded by Historic England. You see all the people that took part in the project. Um, the draft selection toolkit was sent out for consultation to all all the groups referenced here, all the membership, and then it was workshopped as part of a continuing professional development session at the last year's CIFA conference in Brighton. And the final version was agreed by the working party and based on all the feedback we received and the recommendations from the workshop. And the result is a toolkit for aiding the creation of project specific selection strategies. So, what is a selection strategy? It's nice and big so you can all see. Yes, it is. It details the project specific selection process agreed by all stakeholders which will be applied to the working project archive prior to transfer into curatorial care. Now, if you do this, there'll be lots of benefits. It will promote better collaboration between contracting units, the collecting institutions, specialists, researchers, planning archaeologists, and everyone else who's involved. It will improve the active management of the working project archive, including how you undergo on-site collection and any preservation requirements you have. Um, the dispersal of deselected material prior to transfer of the archaeological archive into a repository. It will ensure that the archive is fit for purpose and that the importance and potential of all the materials have been considered. It will facil facilitate better knowledge of the archive's contents and relevance and therefore it will increase opportunities of reuse when it reaches the store. Um, it should support the adequate allocation of funds and staffing from the outset of the project so we don't get to the point where all the money's gone before it happens. And um, it should improve the efficient use of storage space within the store as well. I'd like to say that <laughs> the information and requirement um, for selection is not new. The toolkit is built, built on existing guidance and best practice. All these documents already say that we should all be doing this. It's just that no one has really defined how to create or at least record selection strategies before this. So the Archie Standards and Guide to Best Practice in Archaeological Archiving Europe by the EAC 
uh, one of the main principles is that standards and procedures for the creation of selection, management, compilation and transfer of the archive must be agreed and documented in the design of every archaeological project and be understood by all project personnel and that selection criteria and procedures must be docu fully documented and included in the project <coughs> archive. So if we pull all the existing guidance and best practice together, we end up with the selection toolkits that have been agreed. And this is what the online resource looks like. Um, the toolkit is generic. It provides a set of tools that are flexible to assist archaeological practitioners during the creation of project-specific selection strategies. It's not intended to be used in the creation of a selection policy. And a selection policy, as opposed to a selection strategy, is where general non-project non specific decisions are made about specific materials or object types with no reference to the aims and objectives of the project or their uh, potential future use. So we are not going to give advice on what selection decisions should be made. We're just giving you the tools to be able to make those decisions yourself. Um, it's not intended to be used in the rationalisation of museum collections, we've already discussed that there's guidance out for that, and it's not intended to be used for the section of human remains, there's lots of HE guidance on that as well. So you can see um, on the side panel, all the sections of the toolkit, there's a background and introduction section, which kind of says what I said here in more detail. Um, there's a definitions page, which is the terms we've used in the toolkit and how we define them. There's a further guidance section, which is a very high level list of standards and guidance to support the selection of, um, and the archiving process and where you can go and find further information. And then there's a, um, a section for downloads of existing um, selection um, strategies. We're hoping that that section will grow as people create selection strategies and will allow us to um, upload them onto the website. And then there's um, the template which kind of looks like this. You can download a version and fill it in yourself and pass it around all um, the relevant stakeholders. There's the first page, which should have all the basic project information on it. There's a page for recording your digital selection, your document selection, your material selection. And then this page can be repeated as many times as is necessary. Um, and then there is a selection strategy checklist as well to ensure that you've done everything you need to do. And this is one that's been filled in by Cotswold. So it is possible, they've done it, and it's um, currently being used on projects that they're doing. So um, a selection strategy should always be applied on a project by project basis. Um, it should take the aims and objectives of the project into account, the local authority guidance, like the brief, um, the collecting policy of the museum, the local regional research frameworks, the relevant thematic or period specific um, frameworks and material specific frameworks. Um, you can see they've kind of documented all of this information here. They've agreed all this with the relevant stakeholders like the local planning archaeologists, the museum and the specialists they're going to talk to. And I think you can see from the type of information, this is all relevant to project managers, I would say, and be really controversial. And it should be project managers that should be filling in this information as they have it to hand. This is not something to be passed to the project archivist as it's the thing that happens at the end of the project, because this is not the case. Um, this isn't the only way to record your selection strategy. Your very small watching brief on a tiny little you know, service trench might only require a few sentences in your WSI. As long as everyone's agreed that that's the way you're going to go forward, that's fine. We just want you to write it down, basically. Um, so then they've got, they've got a page for their digital data and a page for how they're going to take their documents. So for your digital data, it might be that all of these selection decisions are actually covered by your data management plan. And of course, everyone has one of those, and it's not even on nicely. Um, we included a page for digital because we are very aware that not many people have a data management plan at the moment. They should. If your data management plan covers this, it might be that this first page is completely redundant, and you just refer to your data management plan and agree its implementation with the ADS. Um, page four, what you're going to do with all your documents. I mean, it sounds straightforward, but actually things are changing. Maybe that tiny watching brief you undertook was archaeologically sterile, um, and everything is adequately recorded in the report, and therefore an, um, an OASIS only submission is acceptable to preserve the archive in perpetuity. Agree those decisions that you're going to um, 
recycle all your bits of paperwork and give back to the environment. It might be that you've databased your entire contact record and added scans of all the nice drawings to the digital record, and therefore you agree that um, a digital only record of your contact sheets is acceptable to be stored for the ADF, and once again, you can recycle all your paperwork. It might be the museum doesn't take paperwork, which is the case with some museums. So, which is why you have to talk to everyone. Or it might be that you want to store absolutely all of this paperwork at the same time, record your decisions and why. And then this is um, Cotswold's version of um, their materials. As you can see, they've broken it down into, they've done book finds, what they're going to do with book finds, and then they've done a whole section for environmental, because they're expecting quite a lot of environmental material off this site. Um, for a small site, probably one, one page would be enough to say we're going to bring everything back to the office and we're going to assess it for selection purposes during post excavation and make decisions then. Fine, okay, put that in your WSI as long as everyone's happy with that. Record your decisions at a later date. For a large scale um, project, I would say that you need a lot more um, detail on your decisions and how you're going to propose selection. Um, but make sure everyone's happy with it, the museum's happy that you're going to get rid of your copious amounts of medieval tile when you're on site, and your specialist has agreed your methodology for recording all that tile um, that's not coming back to the office. Make sure the museum doesn't want some to add to their handling boxes, for example, that we already heard as one option already today. Um, I would say this is already happening on quite a lot of big sites, and a lot of units are already undertaking selection processes. Um, we're just hoping that people record them better because what's ending up in the museum needs to be an accurate record of what was excavated. And this is just one way of achieving that. Okay. This is a slightly different order. Um, the selection strategy that you agree should be provided to all stakeholders and it might be that you're thinking oh, a lot of this information already exists in the other form to be in the WSI or some other or a recording manual but the fact is your museum is very rarely going to see a copy of that WSI recording manual so how are they going to achieve that get get to that information um, you should provide it to all your project personnel so your staff on site know what they're doing and um, you should agree all changes obviously and then when you get Back to post excavation stage, you should assess all the material you've collected and all the documentation you've created specifically for selection purposes. Um, obviously, you should take specialist advice into account when you're doing this, but you should also make them aware that they need to consider selection as part of their assessment on the material um, and provide a selection and retention um, proposal. I mean, obviously, 100% retention is a justifiable. A thing to do on a project, you just need to say why you're doing it. You don't need, to, you shouldn't be retaining 100% of the material you'll take, you've collected if you haven't got a good reason to do so. Um, who's the toolkit for? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and say everyone who works in archaeology for projects. It's just easier. Okay, so if we do this, what are we hoping to achieve through the implementation of a selection process? Um, the, whole, the aim of the whole thing is to ensure that all the elements retained from the working project archive for inclusion in the archaeological archive are appropriate to establish the significance of the project and support future research, outreach, engagement, display and teaching activities. So if your museum or repository is aware of the archives coming their way and what they contain, and if they can understand and access the archaeological archive that they're taking due to curation basically forever, that means we're creating a positive leg legacy with our archaeological archives. Um, so how are we going to, you know, hope this aim is going to be met? Well, the creation of project-specific selection strategies, and hopefully the issue of the toolkit, um, we're wanting this to become everyday practice eventually. Firstly, see if we're going to ensure that selection um, is seen as best practice, and it will be part of the standards and guidance on archaeological archiving and the implementation of project-specific selection strategies will be assessed as part of RO applications and inspections. Um, it's not the use of the toolkit that CEQA will be assessing, it's the um, implementation of selection strategies. Um, obviously these amendments aren't expected to be immediate, but we are hoping maybe by about some time next year people will be thinking about this on a, on a regular basis. Um, obviously, it's not just CEPA who are going to be monitoring this. It's also going to be happening through the planning process, and Algeo members are currently working up their own checklist um, and how to help with monitoring of the selection process throughout the life of the project. 
Um, we are, as part of the project, we are also going to be running a series of workshops to be held across the country this summer. They are going to be free to attend and which will be provided. Just encourage you all to come along. Um, the ad the uh, advertising for those workshops will probably be out in the first half of May. So I hope to see you all there. Um, and just as a final thought, um, I'm very keen on this idea of selection and ensuring that what we are keeping forever is sustainable and we are leaving a decent legacy behind. But um, these are just a few of the nice photos of things I've found while excavating through the old Boon Howe archives. Um, and now the majority of rec um, archaeological records created today, they don't really contain fag packets or little notes about you know, buying things off people reluctantly anymore. But they do still contain, uh, you know, teen photographs or the drawings that some kid did when they came to an open day. And I just think that we need to ensure that while we're preserving the most accurate and sustainable archaeological legacy we can for future generations, we're not going to lose all those things that make archaeology what it really is. Thank you. This is everyone that's been involved in the project. So thank you. <laughs>